Okay, good afternoon. Um, thank you all for coming to the sixth, I think, Digital Classes Seminar of um, Summer 2019. Um, we're extremely pleased this week to welcome uh, Georgia Kolovo, who is um, both has a teaching position at the University of Paris Nanterre and is a non-residential fellow at the Center for Hellenic Studies at Harvard University. Um, and um, Georgia is going to talk to us about um, the Homer Multitext Project and her work in, on this in particular, which is translating the Homeric Scolia um, in the manuscript Venetus of Hay. So I'll hand over to Georgia. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. Mm -hmm. I'm really very, very happy to be here with you in the summer seminar in London. Uh, so I'm Georgia Colombo. Uh, as Gabby said, uh, I have defended my thesis in the University of Sorbonne in Paris. Actually, I teach in the University of Montreal. And I have an honors national fellowship from the Center for Land Studies. And today we'll present you the digital project of the Center for Land Studies, the Omer Multitext Project. And precisely the objective of this paper is to explain something of the significance of the manuscript, the to say, of the 10th century, and to describe the work of transcribing and translating this manuscript in its form. Okay. So now I think that you are ready. And when pass, uh, we can pass to our presentation. Sorry. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, oh, uh, so I should be there. Never mind. Okay. So, concerning the plan of our presentation, first of all, uh, I will present you briefly the history of the manuscript when I do say of the 10th century. Uh, then I will give you the classification of the Merix Scolia and the definition of the Merix Scolia. Then we will pass to the electronic edition of this manuscript, which is the basic work of the Omer Multitext project. Then we will work together on the translation of the Merix Scolia in the structural and semantic markup of this digital edition. And finally, I will, show you that, I will show you that this digital project can be considered as a part of an ecosystem in the field of classical studies. So now, let's start from the manuscript. So the manuscript that you see here, known as the Venetus A, is the oldest complete text of the Iliad in existence. A scribe whose name we will never know, labored to create the 654 pages of this book during the 10th century. This famous manuscript belonged to the collection of Cardinal Bessarion, who began collecting books at a very early age and initially on a very constrained budget. When the news of all of Constantinople came to Italy, Bessarion wrote a letter to his friend Michael Apostolis. Precisely, he wrote that he had already collected many Greek books for his own pleasure, but now that Constantinople was in the hands of Ottoman Sultan, he wanted to acquire all Greek literature to keep it in some safe place where it would be accessible to all readers until Greece was once again free. So he expressed his intent in this letter to create a national Greek library for, for the Greeks above all, but also for the benefit of the humanity. In 1468, Bessarion donated his library to the Venetian Republic with the certainty that the government of the city would preserve it forever. His library still exists in Venice, in the Marciana Library, and evidently his library had many manuscripts of Homer, but by far the most important was the text of the Iliad known as the Venetusei. This manuscript faded from the awareness of European scholars over the next centuries until it was rediscovered in the Marciana Library by the French humanist Jean-Baptiste Gaspard de Villoison, who recognized the value of the manuscript and published a printed edition of its content in 1788. So now, as you see here, a typical folio uh, in the Venetusei, with a few exceptions, contains, as you see here, 25 lines of the Homeric text surrounded on three sides by a body of marginal notes. In other words, as you see in the center of the folio, there is the body text with the 25 verses, and we have the marginal and the interlinear annotations that accompany the body text as you see here. These scholia are what make the Venetus A such a treasure for students of Homer. 
Precisely. This scolia made the Veneto sage an extremely valuable source of information about the composition, content, meaning and history of the epic. Because of the large size of folios and its beautiful script, it is considered a luxury codex. As you see here, it has 24 uh, enlarged initials that mark the beginning of each book. Not only they serve to ornament the codex, they also aid the reader by indicating the division of the text into books. As you see here, for example, the letter M, the letter A, the letter T, and the letter Z, which is also my favorite one. At the top of each page that, begin, uh, that, begins, um, that begins a book of the Iliad, the manuscript, as you see here, includes a one-line summary or highlights of the contents of that book in red ink. These summaries are themselves in the dactylic hexameterometer of Homeric poetry. Originally, this manuscript was not illustrated, but illustrations were introduced in the beginning folios of the manuscript at a later date, most likely in the 12th century. According to the research of Ioli Calavrezu, these illuminations depict mythological scenes from the judgment of Paris up to the fighting of the Trojan War. And to the Trojan War, I will show you here very, very quickly some images which were painted around the introductory text of Proclus since it is the only section not accompanied by scholar in the margin. As you see here, this full page composition is divided into two scenes. The upper, here is the upper. Uh, the upper, which takes two thirds of the paper, depicts the moment when at the banquet held by Zeus in celebration of the marriage of Peleus and Tetis, Ares, the goddess of this court, throws onto the table a golden apple inscribed to the first one. As you see here, the golden apple is found on the center of the table. In this scene, we see Zelsa here, sitting on the table on the left, who is dressed like a Byzantine emperor. He wears a gold embroidered long porphyry tuning with a white collar and belt. He has a diadem, a red shoes, a privilege of the emperor, and he also holds a scepter. The other figures on the table here, are three women. Um, uh, inscriptions identify these figures as Ira with the red dress, huh? then Athena in the middle and toward the back, and Aphrodite seated all the way to the right in a similar pose and opposite to this. These three goddesses claim the apple placed on the table in the foreground by extending their hands as you see here toward it. The inscription on the apple says, here I read it from Greek, Ikali, Laveto, Tumilo, which means the fairest may receive the apple. The apple has been thrown by Ares, who is depicted still holding the apple within a window or a balcony, but she is no longer recognizable except for her arm. As you see here, you can see only the arm of Ares, but she is no longer recognizable. The second, in the second image, as you see, Helen uh, is dressed in a red garment with her hands covered. She stands rather formally, conscious of two women on either side, who are much more agitated. Their hands are in motion, as if both are speaking to her. Helen is distinguished by the gold leaf decoration applied on her head and on her garment. It is not clear what exactly this scent is meant to convey. Perhaps they're warning her against her decision to go away with Paris, which will have dire consequences. And the last image, the bottle scene extends over the exterior and foot margins of the folio. Two oarsmen sit on the right of the mast, and on the left are Aphrodite, Paris, and Ellen. Ellen would barely be recognized except for the name in large black letters far above her head. Both Paris and Aphrodite are also labeled with their names above, uh, placed above their heads, as you see here, of Paris, the Aphrodite, and the city is depicted as a tall stone tower with crenellations, a heavy double door at the gate, uh, and possibly with some figures inside the fortification, and two black letters identified, as you see here, as Itria. And this illustration, which is meant to communicate the arrival of Paris with Ellen at Troy, brings the story of the judgment of Paris to an end. Concerning the source of so much scholarly material, the Venetus A itself tells us where many of the scholia come from. At the end of most of the books of the poem, there appears this subscription that you see here. So many of the scholia are derived from the work of these four Homeric scholars from antiquity. So as you see here, we have Aristonicus, Didymus, Elodian, and Nicanor. 
Scholars refer to the work of this man as the four-man commentary, or in German, Femena Kommentar. So precisely, Aristonicus wrote on the topic of editorial symbols attached to the text. Herodian wrote on questions of um, prosody, that is poetic meter. Nicanor wrote about punctuation, and Edimus wrote about the earlier editorial work of the great Alexandrian scholar Aristarchus. So consequently, the scribe of the Venetus A was for his time a master of what we call now information technology. His manuscript brings together a text of the Iliad, all the wealth of 2,000 years of scholarship, word glosses, summaries, and bibliography in an extremely efficient, compact, and durable package. This wealth of data was not assembled or presented randomly. Each Iliadic book begins with an illuminated capital, a theometrical summary of the book's content, and ends with a highlighted subscription, including information on the four-month commentary and the final note reminding the reader of what, of what book just ended. So the value of the Venetus A lies in the precise, intentional compilation and juxtaposition of all these elements that I have already presented you. Then we pass to the classification of the Homeric scholia. Most of the scholia to the Iliad fall into three basic groups. The first one, the A scholia uh, are termed, the first group are the uh, scholia A. The A scholia are termed critical, and they come from the margins of our manuscript, the manuscript Venetus A of the 10th century. Near to, this near to this group of the scholia, there are tested critical signs, which are really very, very important for the comprehension of the Homeric text in relation to the Homeric scholia, but also in relation to the modern translation. And you can confirm it here on this example. As you see here, it is a lemma, a part of the Homeric quotations, uh, a part of the Homeric quotation, I read it in Greek. It says, Eske, if in Neopos. Near to this verse, there is a critical sign of the claim. But as you see here, the scholia starts with the conjunction of the, which means because. I read the scholia from the manuscript. Eske, if in Neopos, of the parechi in prophecies, of sento, of siva, if of most. As you see here, the scholar starts with the conjunction oti, which means because, oti parelki prophecies, because the preposition is redundant. If you translate the text that I see by saying, ex kinifiniokos, he was a charity, because the preposition is redundant, we understand there's not any correlation between the Omeric text and the Omeric scholar. But if we consult the manuscript, we see that near to this Omeric verse, the, there is a critical sign of the play. So I can understand it, and consequently I can translate it by saying, he was a charity, the display is there because the preposition is redundant, also in top of the Latin of most, as in the uh, verse, the Sermon of Poseidon. So, for this special group of scholars, it's really very, very important to consult simultaneously and systematically the American manuscript in order to make a comprehensible and a readable translation. Then we have a second group, uh, the British folia. They are so named because they are found in the manuscript T, 11th century and in the descendants of the lost manuscript B, 6th century. These scholia are also known as the exegetical scholia because they are concerned primarily with the interpretation of the Homeric verses rather than textual criticism. And finally, we have the discolia. The discolia, which are erroneously named after the Demos, are also known as scholia minora or scholia vulgata. Our sources, as you see here, are the manuscript Z and Q, which date to the 9th and 11th century, respectively. The major component of the discolia is lexicographical, as you see here, consisting of short definitions or explanations of obscure words, mythological and allegorical explanations, plot summaries, and paraphrases. So, under Venetus A, the discolia appear, as we will see, as interlinear nodes and are largely glosses, short definitions of words in the poem. So, consequently, the interest uh, in this uh, school is twofold. Firstly, in terms of content, they preserve significant information on the Homeric text and on its commentary inherited from the Alexandrians and their successors, and they constitute an encyclopedia of fancy and knowledge. And secondly, secondly, in terms of functionality, they provide the departure point for a larger and more ambitious investigation since these scholia are the forefathers of our contemporary footnotes and hypertextual links. And since we talk about the hypertextual links, we can pass now to the electronic edition of this manuscript, which is the basic work of the Omer Multitext project. So in 2007, digital photographs of the manuscript were acquired by a team from the Center for Linux Studies. 
And this digital publication of the manuscript leads, in a, in a way, to a new kind of preservation of the manuscript. These photographs also return the scholia to their physical place on the page, allowing the reader a special understanding of the relationship, of the relationship between text and commentary. The reader also has direct access to both uh, text of the epic and the commentary. The distant nature, nature and quality of the images create the opportunity for another rediscovery of the manuscript and its contents, since even the smallest marginal notes can be read in detail. Digital technologies give us the opportunity to zoom in on the marginal notes and color correction, and other technologies such as ultraviolet photography allow for the greatest contrast to be brought out on faded or damaged text. For example, as you see here, on the first page of the text of the Iliad, there is, as you see here, a beautiful leaf adorning the top right corner. The text uh, which is found inside that leaf, as you see here, is completely illegible in the natural light image. Ultraviolet light revealed the bulk of the text, huh? and the researchers of the Center for Hellenic Studies were able to determine that it consists of a previously known comment from the Discolia about the way that the action of the poem begins in the 10th year of the war, as you see here, of Romulus, of Rotum, the Caetus. And indeed, throughout the manuscript, both the natural light images and those captured with ultraviolet light reveal text that cannot be seen with the naked eye. Consequently, this project is a complete scholarly edition of the special manuscript, its text, Scholia, and all other elements on its 654 pages. The text and scholia have been transcribed as a digital diplomatic edition, representing faithfully the text of the manuscript and marked up with TI XML encoding for several key features. Each portion of the digital text, that is each line of the poetry and each individual scholio, has been given a unique identifier and linked precisely to the location on the digital image of the folio that contains it. Any user can easily move from the diplomatic edition to the image of the primary source and see what the manuscript says. There are two interrelated procedures that the researchers of the Center for Hellenic Studies have followed for creating the digital edition of this manuscript. First of all, we have the creation of an image index at map of full writing on each folio site, including the lines of the poetry, individual scholia, and other marks or images present on the page, as you see here, we can browse by page reference and we can select the page of the manuscript on which we want to make our shirts. And secondly, we have the creation of a diplomatic edition of the poetic text and of each at every scholion, representing the spelling, punctuation, and accentuation as it appears. The researchers, starting at the top of the image of each folio, know the beginning and ending of each scholion and use a digital tool developed by Christopher Blackwell and Neil Smith for this purpose, the image citation tool, to define the space and location of that scholion on the page. So each set of scholia, main marginal scholia, intermarginal, interior, exterior, and interlinear scholia, is defined within the structured markup. And before working together on this structure markup, I present you the organization of the scholia using TI elements for text division. First of all, the scholia are organized by book of the Iliad using TI division elements. Each scholion is contained by division with the technical vocabulary that you see here. And each scholion contains two further TI division elements, the first one with the lemmas and the second one with the comments. That means that the researchers of the Center for Learning Studies have uncoded the scholia, the lemmas and the comments. Within the transcription of lemma time comments, the researchers also encode the following TI elements as well as others. First of all, the personal names, that means that we can define the criteria for research and we can find all the personal names that are attested in the manuscript. And these names are marked and also cataloged in tables within the GitHub repository as a record of all personal names as well as a means to search for them and to distinguish different individuals with the same name. Then we have the place name. They have followed approximately the same procedure for the same name, for the place name. These names are similarly marked and cataloged. Then we have the expanding and abbreviated form of the words. In most cases, we have the abbreviations of the morphological endings of the words 
as you will see in the exam in the exams that I have prepared. And within a choice element, the expanded version of a reading as interpreted by the editor is provided with the abbreviation as it appears in the manuscript. And finally, we have the quotations, that means the text quoted from an external source. And now, thing that we are ready, we can pass it to the translation. We will work together on the translation um, uh, of the Merex Folia in the structure and semantic markup of this digital edition. And in other words, uh, we're going to make a comparison between the scolia attested in the manuscript, their electronic transcription, and their translation in the markup of the edition. Before starting uh, this activity, I'd like to make a very, very general remark by saying that I don't produce, of course, all of the markup, but only the structural and semantic markup that makes sense for a readable translation. In other words, I respect the norms of the translation, and I don't change the word order in, of normal English because of the markup. We will discuss about some uh, decisions for the translation in this markup, and you will see how we can make a readable and comprehensible translation. Uh, I have chosen some questions because these questions are innumerable, so I, cho I chose uh, the basic questions and the, co the questions which are tested more frequently in the manuscript. So first of all, uh, the Greek quotations in the translation. We will see why it's really very, very important to keep the Greek quotations in this markup of the edition in order to make a comprehensible and a readable translation. Then we'll have the grammatical explanations of the scolia, the elliptic form of the scolia, the scolia which referred to the punctuation, accentuation, and spelling of the Meric words, the morphological analogy of the Meric words, and the lexicographical scolia, uh, which give us synonyms, adonyms, derivatives, etc. So, as I told you, these questions can be numerable. I chose simply the question which are tested frequently, but my purpose is to give simply an idea of transcribing and translating in digital form this corpus of the scolia attested in the manuscript Venetus A. And so we can start from the first example. As you see here, we have a name in the David case, the Dio, which means over the plane. For this word, there is a story which is found near to this word. I read it from the manuscript, of the elite, as you see, there is a repeated form of the verb elite, of the elite, e dia, e na, e dia, the dio. The electronic transcription of the manuscript that I have already read is the following. As you see here, we have the repeated form of the verb elite. Then we have the expanded version of the verb as it was read and interpreted by the editor. And then we have the second part of the story. As you see, as I told you, most cases have the abbreviations of the morphological endings of the words. So the translation that I propose is the following. As you see here, I said the display is there because I put into I put this phrase in the in the bracket, uh, this introductory phrase in order to demonstrate the relationship between the text and the and the story. The display is there because the preposition via over is omitted, so that it would be via the beam over the plane. So, as you see here, concerning the translation of the verb elib, elib, I prefer a literal translation because I don't do things that imitate the absence of a syllable in Greek text or reproduce the expanded and the unexpanded version of the verbatim text. But I prefer making, a, uh, I prefer a literal translation. So that's why I said simply is omitted, so that it would be the update over the plane. As you see here, I kept the Greek quotation in the English translation. Why? Because the preposition the app is accompanied by a noun in the genitive case, the app is you. So this expression, the app with the genitive case, replaces the word per dio that we, have, that we have seen in the manuscript. So if I don't keep the Greek quotation in the English translation, I don't demonstrate the grammatical sense, the grammatical nature, and the grammatical function of the Greek scholar in relation to the Greek text. So concerning the second uh, scholar that I have chosen, I read from the manuscript, Ut Aristarchos via to Sigma, I the via to Ita. The electronic subscription of the scholar is the following. As you see here, um, we have the abbreviated form of the adverb, because as I told you, in most cases we have the abbreviations of the morphological index of the words. Then the expanded version of the adverb, as it was read and interpreted by the anchor. And here we have a startup with the personal name, because there is the name of Aristarchos. And the translation that I propose uh, for this scholar is the following. Thus, as you see, I don't do things that imitate the absence of a syllable in Greek text, so I said simply thus. Thus, Aristarchus writes it with the uh, sigma, others write it with the theta. As you see here, I should put into bracket the verb writes for two reasons. Firstly, because you have an explicit reference to the Aristarchian edition of the Greek text. 
And secondly, because our goal is to complete the elliptic form of the Merck scholia, because the Merck scholia in most cases are in an elliptic form, so we should, um, uh, we should complete uh, the sense. Another typical example of the elliptic form of the Merck scholia is the following. As you see here, in the third scholia, we read an perispate, diaporiticos, that the verb which is omitted is the verb est. That means that the whole sense of the Merck scholia should be the electron transcription of this story is quite simple. They have encoded um, simply as a common. Here, of course, is the number of the book and the number of the markers. And concerning my translation, I said um, uh, if it has a, a circumflex accent, it is interrogative. And I should put into brackets the verb is because I added the verb in order to complete the elliptic form of the Merck scholia. Uh, then we have another scholia which refers to the punctuation of the Merck scholia. Uh, we have many times scholia which refer to the punctuation, accentuation, and spelling of the Merck words. This scholia says, Ipospicteo epito feri, ina stijome epito imeteras. The electron subscription uh, is here, it's quite simple as I told you, they have simply encoded as a comment. And the translation is the following. Is the following, they translate in this way. It is necessary to put a comma after ferry, which means leg, so that we punctuate after imeteras, which means hour. Since it is a scholar which refers to the punctuation of the Merck word, of the Merck text, it's absolutely necessary to define the word on which we make the reference. Because if I would say it is necessary to put a comma after leg, so that we punctuate after hour, it doesn't make any sense. I don't demonstrate the relationship between the Merck text and the Merck scholar. So for all these categories of scholar which refer to the concentration, punctuation, and spelling of the Merck words, it's necessary to define the word on which we make the reference. Uh, then we have another scholar, it is a lexicographical scholar, that means the scholar which gives us synonyms. We have, um, we have the lemma phileasium here. It is, a, uh, it is a verb, which means he showed hospitality. Near to this Homeric verse, as you see here, is that there is the critical sign of deep length. And here is the scholar which says, admit to exemption. If we zoom in on the text, we can read it better. Uh, uh, it says, admit to exemption. Mm -hmm. So, um, the electron transcription is quite simple. Uh, where is it? Here. They have a it as a common, as you see. Uh, my translation is the following. Uh, since we had a, a, a critical sign near to this Homeric text, uh, near to this uh, verse, the sense is the following. The display is there because this verb is found instead of exenism, which means it shows hospitality. Since it is a lexicographical scholium, it's absolutely necessary to demonstrate that we have two Greek verbs for the same expression in English. Phileiskin and exenism are two Greek and two verbs are two uh, Greek verbs for the same expression in English, shows hospitality. So it's necessary to demonstrate the lexicographical nature, the lexicographical function of the Merck scholium in relation to the Merck text. And then we pass to the last uh, no. Uh, it's a scholar on which you have already worked. Um, as you see here, it's a scholar um, uh, with the conjunction of the uh, on we, uh, that, they have, that they have already presented. As you see here, concerning the electron description, they have encoded as a lemma because it was a part of the main quotation. And then you have the second part of the scholar. Here, as you see, there is a start of the lecture queue because it is a quotation which is extracted from the Odyssey, which is now because most is a quotation from the Odyssey. And then we have another starter with a personal name because there is a name of Posidon. And concerning my translation, as I told you, I said the display is there. I put into bracket this introductory phrase in order to make a comprehensible translation because the preposition is in downtown as in the verse uh, Posidon and Cosmos, the serum of Posidon. In this case, which is the redundant preposition? It's a preposition typo. But also in the word ifineokos, it is uh, a word which is derived from the word ipo, ifineokos. So if I don't call the Greek quotation here, I cannot demonstrate the grammatical nature of the American scholar in relation to the American text. So that's why it's really uh, very, very important to keep also the Greek version. And this is the last um, American scholar uh, that I have chosen. Uh, it is a more complicated, I would say. Because it is called which refers to the accentuation of the word primina, 
that you see here, but also it is a scolio which refers to the morphological, to common morphological endings between some adjectives of the Homeric text. I will show here the scolio uh, for the world premiere, which is found uh, at the beginning folio, at the beginning part of the folio of the manuscript. If we zoom in on the manuscript, we can read it better, as you see here. Uh, and as you see, the scholar which refers to the concentration of the word me, but also to the common accent on the final syllable between the adjective, adjective, signos, uh, uh, pignos, and primnos. The electron, uh, the electron transcription of this scholar is quite simple. They have uh, encoded, as you see here, um, they contain so the words that are coded in the text. Uh, that's why we have a start that's in the letter code. But now the translation. How can I demonstrate that we say primi as between if I say primi as dense? It doesn't make any sense. I don't demonstrate the morphological analogy between the word primi and uh, picnic. How can I demonstrate that these three adjectives are accented with an adjective on the final syllable because all the adjectives uh, um, are ending in the same syllable nos? If I say they are accented with an adjective on the final syllable as dense and the most infrequent. It doesn't make any sense. So that's why for all this category of scholia, which refers to, to the morphology of the Homeric words, it's absolutely necessary to keep also, to quote also sometimes the, uh, the, Greek, uh, the Greek versions of the text. So as you see, uh, the XMLTI is a constant stimulation uh, for reflection and for taking very, very small, but very, very important decisions for the quality of our text. And with this, uh, so progressively with this kind of methodology of our translation, uh, the translation of the Benetto series Scolia for the Omer Multitex project will be complete and will faithfully represent what is on its page. Concerning the progress of our work, we have already translated the books uh, five and six, and there will be a progressive incorporation of the translation in the website um, uh, during, uh, during this summer. And finally, I would like to show you that um, this digital project that I presented uh, today very, very quickly, of course, is not the only one. But this digital project can be considered as a part of an ecosystem in the field of classical studies, whose aim is to publish online ancient text translations and commentaries. First of all, as you see, there is uh, the Perseus project of Gregory Crane. Uh, which is a digital, um, which is um, uh, which is a digital library project of Dutch University. Then you have the Open Greek and Latin project of the University of Leipzig, uh, whose goal is to represent every source, uh, every source text produced in classical in classical Greek or Latin from antiquity through the present. Another project which is based on XMLTI is a text of the scholar of Euripides, edited by Donald Mastroma. And as you see here, the editor divides the scholar and scholia veteran, scholia veteran translation, scholia veteran translation of the Paradis uh, excluding Yossi, scholia of scholia of Manus, Moscopulos, uh, Thomas Manchester, the Clinian scholia, the Clinian of the text. And as you see, behind this small part of the screen, there is all the technological infrastructure of XML TEI that I have already presented you. Um, then you have the project uh, Iperdona. It is a collection of digital editions of ancient commentaries with a translation of the Paradus Criticus. As you see here, for example, if we click on the letter L, you can have all the notes for the text. If we click on the letter C, you can have all the quotations that are present for this text. And then you can have the corrections of the editor, um, some uh, supplementary com um, quotations, lemmas, uh, some corrections on the manuscript, etc. Uh, then there is uh, the project on the American Scolia of the University of Nanterre, where we work on the Scolia edited by Herbs and prepare a French translation of this enormous corpus of edition of uh, Herbs. It is an edition uh, which contains approximately seven volumes of the American Scolia, but many of the Scolia are, are omitted by this edition. Um, and then we have, uh, of course, the project Epidoc, Epigraphic Documents. It is an international collaborative effort that provides guidelines and tools for encoding scholarly and educational editions of ancient documents. So as a part of this ecosystem, the digital edition of the manuscript serves as a bridge between the ancient and medieval transmission, and it preserves in its margin a historical record of many previous editions of the poem, as well as a treasure trove of ancient scholarly interpretation. By editing the Venetus A, the Omer Multitext project makes a technological breakthrough in the presentation of the Iliad, and with it, readers receive a much clearer picture of where our Iliad comes from. 
As we said at the beginning of our presentation, when the news came to Venice that Byzantium had fallen, Bessarion wrote that he wanted uh, to collect the literature of of Greece to keep it in some safe place where it would be accessible to all readers. In 2007, the latest generations of librarians keeping uh, Bessarion charts decided that some safe place meant everywhere where people care. Later, the researchers of the Omar Multitex project decide that some safe place meant everywhere where people can see it, read it, it research it, it, studied it, and admire the unparalleled beauty, design, and construction of this cultural artifact. Thank you very much for your patience and your attention. Thank you, Georgia. That was um, fascinating both overview of the, 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 the manuscript and the history of the manuscript, the, the, um, the background and history of the Homo Multitech project um, as a whole, and in particular your own work and the decisions you've had to make on the, um, on the translations and the encoding of the translations of those, of those very complex um, Scobia documents. So fascinating, lots to, lots to think about and talk about there. Thank you very much. Um, I suspect we could we could talk about this for a long time and bore everyone else to tears. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pass on, on starting with a question and see if anyone else wants to, uh, wants to jump in. Uh, isn't there also a, a project to translate the Scobia in print at Oxford? Vision plays uh, involved with that. Um, I don't know if we had enough about it, but I know there is this sort of Collaborative project. Oh, I, I think I'm not sure that uh, probably it's a manual from the University of Princeton. I'm not sure about it. But generally, it's an enormous project. So uh, it's an enormous project which demands a collaborative effort because we talk about 24 books of the Iliad. So uh, normally, uh, the Center of the Lecture Studies wants collaborations on this topic for all the researchers who work on the school and who are willing to translate uh, the school. And it's also, it's interesting, according to my opinion, to say that until now there has not yet existed a comprehensive edition of this remarkable manuscript at in, at in Scotland. And thus, in all systematic way to evaluate the ethnic doctors. Of course, we have the edition of first. We work on this edition of the University of Paris. Um, we prepare the translation, but even if it is an enormous edition which contains seven volumes, many of the eight scholars are omitted. And many of the scholars does include are truncated or amended by the editor. So this digital structure edition incorporates the feature annotation uh, of each comment on the manuscripts, uh, uh, permitting in a way a uh, special understanding of the relationship between text and the scholar. That's why I think that uh, it's important to have a digital version on, on this, uh, this manuscript. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, I have a question, but it's a simple marginal question. So, uh, That's appropriate. Okay, my question. <laughs> <Martin, laughs> <Martin, laughs> <Martin, laughs> it's, uh, it's a marginal question about the marginal. Um, you were saying that some bits of text have been made usable thanks to digital imaging. You did some of the spectral and things like that. I was wondering, um, the text that you let's say, extracted through this digital enhancement, is that encoded as such? Like, if I look at the, you know, at the TRXML, does it say somewhere, this text was made readable by digital enhancement in, in some ways? Yes, in the website, yes, in the website of the Center for Einstein, there is all of this, uh, there is an introductory page, all of these um, methodological uh, questions. Yes, okay. and you're in the website, you find all the on the introduction about the digital But does that, does that tell you which lines were unreadable with the naked eye that you were that you enhanced with, with the digital methods? Or does it just say in general that a lot of words? Does it tell you specifically? Yes, 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 in the first page of the, of the PowerPoint, there is, yeah. I demonstrate that there is a correlation yes, yeah. okay. between the lines and yeah. the, yeah. the digital version. Yes, that's um, a nice word. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Uh, it's also it's, it, it's important to say that this, this digital version of the manuscript um, gives us the opportunity to treat the text uh, not as a text to be taken apart, collected or collated, but one must study it as a whole text, as a whole entire. That's really very, very important to click uh, uh, in this website and have all the benefits as a book, uh, as a whole entire. It's really very, very important. 
the school uh, give us um, offer us a, 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 an otherwise inaccessible view of how the merit quality was read and understood in the technical. That's really very, very important. Presenting at the same time a great, a great deal of, of historical information on the alternate versions of the, of the text, as you, as you mentioned. That's why I think that's the, uh, it's, it's good. And thank you for the presentation. I have a question about the manuscripts itself. Do you, do you know how, how many copies, how big is this manuscript? It's 654 pages. Uh, yes, it's uh, right over, right over, so it's 654 pages. Uh, written by one. But one, one sky, one. but unfortunately, yes, but only one sky, yes, but unfortunately I uh, would know his name. But there, uh, as I told you, um, we had, uh, we had some illustrations of the 12th century. Uh, um, um, they, uh, near to the introductory text of Proclus because it's the only part where there were not the uh, story. But uh, yes, it was only on Skype and unfortunately we know yeah. his name. And also Bessarion uh, made some uh, some very small modifications, I think. Mm -hmm. when, uh, when he had the manuscript, there are one or two pages that were omitted, so... It must have been yeah. a, a, yes. a great work. I mean, yes. 600 is this elaboration. Yes. Um, yeah, that's why I said that it's a kind of uh, cultural artifact, that's yeah. why I said it's a kind of uh, a treasure of the students of Homer, but not only for the students of Homer, for everybody. So we assume, do we, that it was all written at, at one time, apart from these editions yes, we'll talk yes. about later. So the, the, uh, the scribe, yes, the the scribe wrote the lines of Homer and the interlinear comments and all the marginal comments in the in different yes, font sizes yes, and yes, so uh, forth. The, the all, and this was all done at once. It wasn't it wasn't done in multiple stages. It wasn't a text at home that someone later came and added notes and then someone else no. added a different note. It was all exactly. done in one go and planned exactly. from the start as this talk. Because it looks it looks almost haphazard at times. It looks as if this part was added at a different time than this, doesn't it? So if this this is almost like an afterthought, but 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 it was all planned because they have different the different parts of text have different functions and uh, purposes. No, no, because um, the scribe then is not known. Mm -hmm. uh, he copied the text and then he started to make a compilation of all this Homeric scholia. But all yes. of this was written by the same, uh, by the right. same, same right. Uh, by the same hand, yes. the same manuscript yes. hand. So sometimes, as I told you, there are some uh, modifications, but then probably it was mm -hmm. the same. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which century once again? In which you know, time frame is this manuscript is dated? 10th century. 10th century. Okay. 10th century. Okay. Yeah, we're going to say the 10th century. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a compilation of the words of the four four main commentaries: Aristotle, the Dima, Amicana, mm -hmm. and. And that's common, you know, for a one scribe to. Yes. To Yes, comma, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, the, the commas are divided in three categories, as I told you, the scoria, the, the critical scoria, which refers to the critical science, um, which are um, to the critical science, or some, some verses are advertised, or some verses uh, should be in other places. Then we have the exegetical scoria, which refers to the interpretation of the merit verses. And then we have the lexicographical scoria, as I demonstrated you, would give us synonyms, synonyms, derivatives, etc. So there are two, there are three different categories of the microscopy. And also, it's it's common for a scribe to have a job in this yes, in yes, this yes, period. Yes. And we do have our of course, of course, other other exactly. other scribes who have come over exactly, and something exactly. similar in this. Yes. Yeah. And of course, I will not get names. Yeah. That's really. Yeah. And we expect, I suppose, that if. If another scholar and another scribe had put together another, you know, at the same sort of edition, pulling together scholia, they would have pulled them together from different places and they would end up with a different piece of work. They wouldn't just be copying yes. a previous yes, scholiated yes. edition. Of course, of course. Yeah. So, it, so, so it, there is, although it's all copied, there is still a lot exactly. of creative input. That's why we tell yeah. you we told that this manuscript presents a wealth of 2,000 years. Yes. So there are the closest, the Cascolia, the Cascolia, mm -hmm. so it's a kind of change. Yeah. Yes. And that's the only complete version of, uh, of the Aeolian. Yeah, exactly. 
it's exactly. Uh, That's why exactly, one, exactly. One, and it was rediscovered by the French humanist Jean Baptiste Gaston of the Eurozone, who recognized the value of the manuscript and he decided who, who discovered the Marcana Library and who decided to make the first edition. It's the earliest complaint. Yes, the earliest complaint. Yes, yes. The French yeah, humanist yeah. Uh, we understood what who discovered the value of this manuscript mm -hmm. after the author, the great author of Messiah. Mm -hmm. That's why the research of the Center for Learning Studies wanted to, to continue the dream of Bessarion and to keep alive this, uh, this manuscript. Okay, I'm going to turn off YouTube, um, so goodbye to our listeners from, from there. Um, but we can carry on discussing this as long as, uh, as, long as we like.